Hi, and welcome to the European Tours Life on Tour podcast. I'm your host, Ewan Porter, and today I'm joined by one of the most intelligent minds in the world of golf. He's joining us live from the Renaissance Club at the Aberdeen Scottish Open. That man is Eduardo Molinari. Eduardo, welcome to the podcast. Now, I'll get into this a little bit later, but every time that you get back to uh, get back to Scotland, it must conjure up some pretty fond memories. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Scotland obviously has uh, some great memories for me. Uh, two wins uh, early in my career. And uh, it's a place I've always uh, enjoyed to come in to play golf. Even as an amateur, I remember any time the amateur championship was in Scotland or we played the St. Andrews Lynx Trophy many times. It was always uh, something different in the, in the air. Well, let's take a dive back to the start of your golf career and where it all began for you. In the late 80s, around the age of seven or eight, I believe, is when you started playing golf. And I can't imagine that golf at that time in Italy was a very popular sport at all. So how, how did you and your brother develop a passion for the game? Well, it was uh, mostly through our parents and our family. Um, Mum and dad uh, were keen golfers. Uh, I mean, weekend golfers, but they, they were down to six, seven handicap at their best. And uh, when Francesco and I were about between six and eight years old, we started to go to the golf club with them on the, at the weekend. And uh, we got quite lucky because there was a very good uh, teaching pro at the time, which is still working with me and he worked with Francesco for many, many years. And there was also a large group of uh, young kids, more or less our age, that we could spend time with. So, you know, all in all, it was a very unique situation. We got quite lucky because, as you said, in Italy, golf wasn't the, the most popular sport. But anytime we would cross the gate of the golf club at the weekend, we would find a group of you know, 30, 40 kids and we would play some golf, play some football. There was a swimming pool, maybe play some holes with them. So it was, just a, it was a great way to spend the weekend outdoors and not in front of PlayStation or something similar. Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, anyone who's an avid golf fan would know that uh, your nickname is, is Dodo. So I've, I've got to ask how that came to be. That's very simple because uh, when Francesco and I were, we were both very young kids, I would say the age of two or three, Francesco couldn't pronounce uh, the name Eduardo fully. So he would say Dodo to call me. And, you know, my way of calling him was, uh, was Kiko, which was the, the short version of Francesco in Italy. So that's how we, we came about. And, and they, you know, both nicknames stick for a long time. Well, I referenced you one of the most intelligent uh, minds in the game of golf. You have an engineering degree from the University of Turin in your hometown. Oh, talk to me about that, that period of your career because, and, and why you took that pathway because I can imagine at that age that co uh, college golf in the US was a, was a, um, was a real proposition, as too, I'm sure, uh, was the professional career. So why did you decide to take that pathway? Well, to be honest, at the time, I mean, we're talking 20, 25 years ago, uh, college golf in the States, it was a big thing, but it was more like the British players that would go there and uh, very few players, European players of my generation would go there to, to college. Uh, I mean, I remember, again, players my generation, probably the only one was Luke Donald and I remember, I think Paul Casey went there for a while, but only very, very few. Uh, mm. So, you know, college golf in the States was never a true option. And then the other options were either to turn pro when I was 18 or 19, but at the time I was nowhere good enough. And then I went with the third option, which was to try and take a degree in what I enjoyed, which was numbers, physics, math, and clearly engineering was the, was the obvious choice. And then the plan was at the end of my engineering degree, I would have seen how good I was as a golfer and decide whether I would start a professional golfer career or maybe engineering. Well, you had quite a decorated amateur career. You were English boys champion, Italian amateur champion, Turkish amateur champion. That's all leading into 2005. And then, of course, in 2005, you, you struck the jackpot. You, you reached the pinnacle of the amateur game in in winning the US Amateur Championship at Merion, defeating Dylan Doherty four and three in that final. Could you have ever grasped the, the magnitude of just what that victory would do for your career and everything that came with it? 
Um, well, obviously, I knew US Amateur was a big thing. Uh, I mean, at the time, again, very few players from Europe would go to play the US Amateur. There was no World Amateur rankings or anything. So I had to, even if I was at the time, probably I was one of the best amateurs in Europe. I still had to go over there in the US to qualify, then come back home for a couple of weeks and then go there to play the actual event. And uh, it was very unexpected, obviously. I mean, I was playing well uh, the same, you know, the same summer. So only a few weeks before I had qualified for the Open and I made the cut at uh, St. Andrews as an amateur. But, you know, from there to winning the US amateur, it was uh, obviously very, very unexpected. And uh, I went there with no expectation. I just wanted to play one time before turning pro, which was planned to be in September of the same year. So basically a couple of weeks later. Mm -hmm. And then I had a, a very good week. I got lucky a few times in match play, which you always need to be. And, uh, and I managed to win it. And at that point, a lot of doors opened. So Masters, US Open, and other Open Championship. Uh, a lot of, lot of invites on PGA Tour, European Tour. So I said, well, I might as well stay amateur a little longer. And that's why I turned pro then the following summer in 2006. Well, you referenced one of those perks being uh, getting the opportunity to play in the Masters in 2006. One of the traditions there is that the US Amateur Champion uh, is paired with the, the defending champion of the Masters, the opening two rounds. And of course, that just happened to be Tiger Woods for you in 2006 and your younger brother, Francesco, caddied for you. So describe the overall experience that week. It must have been pretty incredible. Yeah, it was incredible. It was uh, very weird, uh, to be honest, because, um, again, as a young amateur or a good amateur coming from Italy, you know, just playing in the Masters, it's a, it's a dream coming true. Uh, I mean, I remember going back to the US amateur, that, but the game, I was more, I felt the most pressure it was not the final, it was the semi-final, because winning the semi-final gets you into the Masters and US Open. And it was basically, you know, my uh, career goal to be able to play uh, a major in the US. And then... When I won the final, I didn't know at the time, but then as soon as I won, one of the first things that a guy from the USGA told me, he says, oh, you got a good draw at the Masters next year. I said, how do you know? I said, well, the US Amateur Champion plays with the defending Masters Champion, which happens to be Tiger. And I was like, ooh, <laughs> that's <laughs> going to be fun. Uh, and then, you know, I was so lucky that he also won the Open Championship. And at the time, the US Amateur Champion played the US Open with the US Open and Open Championship winner from the previous year. So I got to play with him again at the US Open. Um, I mean, going back to the Masters, uh, it was, as I said, it was very, very weird because I never played in front of that many people. I mean, I played the Open at St. Andrews, which was busy, but the Masters is just, uh, the whole atmosphere is just different. And, and clearly playing with Tiger was another, you know, two steps up. Uh, I just remember, you know, the first tee, uh, it was so weird. I never even felt any pressure. It felt like I was, you know, thrown into the a movie set with Francesco next to me and Tiger shaking hands and, you know, hitting shot after him. It was just, uh, it was crazy. Uh, but it was something that would help me a lot in the, you know, in the, in the future of my career. Uh, both that experience, US Open, getting to play those courses early on. Uh, it just made you realize what, what you needed to work on on your game and, and what you needed to do to be successful. Well, you turned professional after that Open Championship that year in 2006 at Hoylake. How difficult was the decision at, at that point to choose between the US and Europe? Because I can imagine you had ample opportunities on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, uh, it wasn't too difficult because the thing is, I never went to college in the US. Uh, my whole family was based in Italy. My coach was based in Italy. So I had no connection whatsoever to the US. And I thought, you know, at the time with where my golf was at the moment, I thought Europe was going to be the, the easier option for me. So I just turned pro, uh, got seven invites uh, on the European tour until the end of the season, didn't play well went to Q school, didn't play well, and then it was challenged through the following year. But, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to have stuck with the European Tour because if I went to the PGA Tour, I would have felt very much alone and, um, you know, probably it was a, too big of a pun for me. All right, well, I'm going I'm to come back to you, your professional career in a minute. You did, you did reference that you like numbers and you've become 
somewhat of a, a stats man on tour and you've developed your own software. You've been doing it for 15 or 20 years. So tell me about, tell me about the whole uh, stats process and, and what you're doing with that. Well, as you said, I've been doing my own stats for about 20 years now. Uh, I've always enjoyed doing it and I think it's very helpful to my golf game. Uh, anytime I go uh, practicing golf, uh, whether I'm, I'm home or say this week before the event, I know exactly which part of the game I need to work on. And, you know, it's something that I've always enjoyed and it's, it's very helpful, as I said. And then uh, towards the end of 2019, um, a few players start, uh, started to approach me asking if I could help them because they wanted to have not only the stats, but they also wanted to have the advice of a, of a tour player of someone that played golf at a, at a good level, which mm -hmm. is obviously something very unique. And, uh, and so during lockdown in 2020, I started to completely rebuild the, the platform I, I was using for myself uh, so that it would have been easier to enter data, easier to send reports, easier for them to see the patterns, trends and, and strengths and weaknesses. And, um, and basically that's, that's how it started. And then like everything on tour, a few players started off. They were very happy uh, rumors started to spread. And then a year, well, yeah, I basically started July last year. So we're now one year into it and I had to hire a guy full time because I, I couldn't handle all on myself. And uh, it's getting, it's not out of hands, but it's, uh, you know, it, I'm, I'm it's obviously keeping me very busy, which is a good thing because in the bubble on the European tour, there's a lot of downtime, a lot of hours by yourself doing nothing. And if mm. I can spend one or two hours every day just helping others and, uh, and making some side pocket money, I'll do it. Well, that was actually going to be my next question because uh, Matthew Fitzpatrick has become a very high profile adopter of, of your system. But I know that Dean Burmist is uh, using it as well, as, as, as well as several other players. How, how hands on are you yourself with it? I know you've got someone you said helping you out now, but how much one on one time are you spending with these players? Well, as I said, um, you know, a lot of the, the spare time in the bubble is now, you know, looking at their numbers and try to help them as much as I can. Um, I like to be involved because I don't want it to be one of the platforms that, or the apps that you can buy on the Apple Store for, for nothing and just tells you simply the stats. Uh, so I like to be as much hands on as I, as I possibly can. And that's why I'm trying to keep it a little bit limited for now, because obviously I'm still playing. I'm, I have to do my practice. I have to do my stuff. So I don't, I'm not interested in having too many players, but I like to have just a few players that are really into it and think about along the same lines and just uh, being able to help them as much as I can. And, uh, you know, it's, as I said, it's been, uh, it's been very busy, but it's something that I'm still developing. We're now in the process of, enter, of uh, starting to do some strategy with them. So basically each one of them will have their own recommendations for each hole out on tour based on their stats, based on their strengths and weaknesses, how they're playing at the moment. So it's something pretty in-depth, but it's something that players are appreciating more and more. And it's something that if I had it, say 15 years ago when I came on tour, if someone was doing it, I would have signed straight away. Well, you're a year older than me. And I know that when I came came through the Australian junior ranks and then amateur teams and, and turn professional we used to do uh, round analysis sheets but it was it was very simple it was how many fairways you hit how many greens and regulation etc when when you started it was it always very detail oriented or was it always it's something as simple as that no when i first started it was very very simple it was a uh, fairways greens number of parts and then each week each month i would have a new idea add something so, you know, started to enter where I was missing fairways, the distances of the paths, the break on the paths. And now it's, uh, it's very much in depth. Now it's all the way down to where the pin was on the green, and how far the miss was relative to your own target, not to the pin or to the center of the fairway, uh, where the wind is coming from, which type of shot you were trying to hit, whether it was a fade draw, three quarter shot, uh, a flighted shot, whatever that was. And then the, the analysis obviously has got much, much deeper into it, but it's something that it's like, I try to keep it 
as simple as possible when you send the report. But then at the same time, the things we're looking at are so much in depth that it's uh, quite mind boggling. Now, a few years ago, you were the first player to uh, take part in the European tours, Chase the Ace, which for those not familiar, uh, the players that have done it, you get 500 balls and uh, to on a, par, on a particular par three hole to try and make a hole in one. And for us watching, it was extremely entertaining for you. How was it? I, I can imagine that the frustration levels must have risen pretty uh, pretty high during it. Yeah, it was a um, it was a lot of fun. I always thought uh, when when Gibbo, the the tour media guy, came to me with the idea, I thought this is going to be great. Um, it was a lot of fun for the first four or five hours, and then it started to get very very frustrating, as you probably can see in the video. <laughs> Uh, but it's something that uh, you know I've got a great memory of that day. It was um, all in all, I think it was a, a great video. I still have people. I think it was five years ago now, four or five years ago, and I still mm -hmm. have people sometimes, either you know, spectators or people playing in the program asking me how was it or it was such a good video or whatever. So it's uh, it's always a great memory and something that I, I was very happy to take part of. Was there any specific preparation that you had for it? Did you use any of your, your stat system prior to it? No, nothing at all. It was no. just, uh, we picked the hole. I would say, if anything, the green was almost too soft because there was no release, no spin. So it's almost like either you make it on the fly or you don't make it. And it seems like the, the guys that did that do it past me, uh, the other guys that did it, I mean, it was the same thing. I think the only one being able to do it was Andy Sullivan. Mm. I, I think Thomas Peters and Brandon Stone, it was similar. When the game is too soft, it's almost impossible to do it. You need to have some sort of release or spin because it gives you a, a bigger chance to, to make it. But it was, a, I mean, it's a shame. I think they, they haven't done it in a while and, and I'm looking forward to, to the next one, hopefully, because it's a, it was a great, great video. All right, let's go back to your professional career. 2007, uh, your first full year as a prof professional, you said that you, you played on the Challenge Tour and it was a very successful one. You won twice, finished 16th on the Order of Merit, which earned you your European Tour card for the following year. A lot of top amateurs, a lot of elite amateurs, they tend to struggle with the transition to professional golf, but it appeared anyway for you to be relatively smooth. Yeah, I think uh, I turned pro quite late. So I was a, as a, at a good stage in my career. And also I had the advantage of having played majors, tour events when I went on challenge tour. So all of a sudden those courses, they all felt pretty easy, pretty simple, given what I played in the previous couple of years. And uh, I had, as you say, I had, a, I had a good season on challenge tour. I won my very first event on challenge tour playing on a, on a sponsor exemption, which got me a category for the full year and just made things uh, very, very simple. And uh, just managed to get my, I got a little bit injured towards the end of the year, so I couldn't play many events, but still managed to get a card and then play 2008, that was a full-time tour. Yeah, 2008, unfortunately lost your European tour card, but 2009, it was one of the most incredible turnarounds really in, uh, in golf memory, where you went from 753 in the world at the beginning of the year to 48 at the end of the year, you won three times on the Challenge Tour in 2009. You won the Dunlop Phoenix in Japan. I remember you defeated Robert Carlson in the playoff there. Uh, you won the World Cup of Golf, obviously, uh, with with your brother. What did you learn from 2008 to turn it around so much in 2009? Um, well, it was one very simple thing. I I wasn't hitting it well enough off the tee. And with my fairway woods, long irons, up to the mid irons, I, I always been a, a pretty decent short iron and wedge game player, but my long, long game wasn't good enough. And then during that winter, we worked with my coach at the time, just trying to be able to hit the ball from left to right. I always, as an amateur as well, I was always hitting it from right to left. Uh, but then as a, you know, as a pro, you need to hit more fairways. You can't hit too many bad shots, awful shots, because it's much more costly when you miss the fairway. So we tried to, to change that and then straight on from the beginning of 2009, I got to the point where basically I couldn't hit a draw if I wanted to, but then my fade was very, very consistent and just played that year with that same kind of string feeling and, and new technique and obviously it paid off big time. Yeah, it certainly did. Winning that World Cup of Golf 
in China in 2009 with your brother. I mean, the World Cup of Golf is such a, an historic event. It's so prestigious on the golf calendar. What did that do for, for both of you, really, both you and your brother? What did it do for your status back home in Italy and also the game of golf? Well, I think uh, it put the game of golf on the map in Italy because even when uh, Costantino won at Wentworth, he finished second in the Open back in 95, 96. Uh, golf was, you know, it never really grew. It, it still remained a very small sport. Uh, I think when we won the World Cup, it was the first time that golf appeared on the on the front page of the Gazzetta dello Sport, which is like the main newspaper sport newspaper in Italy. And um, so it definitely changed something in the in the narrative of golf in Italy. Look, you had uh, you, you obviously had an incredible two thousand and nine, but winning that World Cup of golf, although it was a teams event, you you beat home the likes of Rory and G Mac and Henrik and and Robert Carlson. Moving into 2010, it must have done your confidence wonders to know that you'd beat them down the stretch in such a pressure-packed event. Yeah, absolutely, because uh, at the end of 2009, just before the World Cup, I think Francesco was just inside the top 15 in the world for the first time. I was just outside. I managed to get in at the end of the year in December. Uh, but one thing is being you know, just in the top 15 in the world. Another thing is being able to beat, as you say, the likes of Rory, GMAC, uh, Hendrik and, and Robert so for our confidence it was a massive boost and I think uh, it showed in, in 2010 when both of us had a really good season a solid season, I had a couple of wins Francesco won later that year at the WGC in Shanghai uh, mm. it was just something that you know more than the win itself, it was what followed the win showed that it was a, it was a massive thing. Yeah well 2010 was your second full year on the European Tour and your two wins they were both in Scotland, both at iconic venues at Glen Eagles and Loch Lomond, but more, even more incredibly, both times paired with your brother in the final group on the final day. An incredible experience to win, obviously, but I can imagine that was amplified by playing alongside Francesco. Yeah, it was a, again, it was a very weird uh, situation to be in. I remember uh, at Loch Lomond, the Scottish Open, I think I was leading by, I want to say, two or three over Darren Clark. And then it was a threesome the last day, so three balls the last day. So Francesco was like, I want to say six or seven behind, so never really had a chance to win. Uh, while Glen Eagles, I think, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, I think he was one ahead going into Sunday. And it was just the two of us in the final group, so it was a proper you know, final group scenario. And uh, I think both times, uh, even if I came out on top, it was very enjoyable for both of us uh, playing together. I think uh, it definitely helped me both times being a little bit more relaxed uh, alongside Francesco. And uh, it's something that, again, it's, uh, it's very unique and something that we will cherish forever and will forever be there. Was there still the same amount of uh, banter and chatter walking down the fairways or was it a little more tense? No, I think it was uh, it was pretty, pretty comfortable, I would say. Uh, I remember... I can't remember exactly which hole at Glen Eagle, but I think we were both, we both needed a few birdies down the last, I think it was down the 16th fairway and we both hit the fairway of the tee. And I think we almost looked at each other and said, right, let's, you know, at least one of us has to make a few birdies to get into a playoff. Uh, so it was, you know, trying to support each other and, and spur each other on. And uh, I was lucky to make three birdies in the last three to eventually win it by one, but it was, uh, as I said, it was very enjoyable, very comfortable setting to be in. Well, 2010 got even better for both of you because later that year, you were both selected by Captain Colin Montgomery to play the Ryder Cup uh, in Wales. The first brothers to play, in fact, in 47 years. Tell me about your, your overall experience that week. I mean, it was uh, unreal. Again, it was uh, something similar to that first Masters with Tiger, uh, getting on that first tee with Francesco, with you know thousands of people singing our names and and songs with our names in it. Uh, it was a uh, it was fantastic. It's something that still to this day, eleven years down the line, gives me goosebumps any time I I talk about it or or think about it. And, um, you know, I've, I haven't given up yet. It's something that I would like to do one more time with Francesco before I retire. And uh, you never know with this sport. I mean, I'm, I'm only 40 years old, which in this sport is still relatively young. 
I feel like I have seven, eight more years of good career in me. And uh, it will be, I mean, it will be a dream come true if we could repeat that one more time. Well, it was uh, it was very wet that week in in Wales. There were a lot of delays, but one one moment that sticks out in my mind was when you were paired with Francesco in the four balls, and I remember he birdied eighteen to earn half a point in front of pretty raucous galleries. That must have been a pretty special moment. Yeah, it was uh, it was crazy because, uh, as you say, we were the last game out, so all the people on the course were basically standing on the eighteenth green or around the eighteenth. And the uh, Celtic Manor, there's a bit of a, an amphitheater around the green, so it was uh, it was packed with people. And um, I remember Francesco missed the short putt on 16, uh, and then 18, he had another short putt to tie the game. And I think probably he was the only one of the whole team who was watching that putt go in. I don't think anyone else in the team was uh, was able to watch uh, to watch that putt, but you know he made it, and it was a big celebration afterwards. And in the singles, you came up against Ricky Fowler. Unfortunately, fell victim to what can only be described as a barnstorming finish from the American. At that point, the matches were all fairly tight. Did at any point did yourself or the European side feel like the Ryder Cup had slipped from your grasp at all? Well, when I I thought if I if I win my game against Ricky, it was probably over. And then when he birdied the last four. Uh, obviously got only half a point instead of a full point and I for for a moment it just crossed my mind that you know I might have lost the Ryder Cup and then I remember um, as I walked down the walk away from the 18th green I was obviously very disappointed uh, and sad but then there was a Billy Foster he came to me put a, an arm around my neck and said come on Eddie let's go and support g -Mac. I think uh, he's going to win it for us which is then what happened and it's something that you know I'm still to this day. I still remember very clearly Billy coming to me and, and walking with him towards the, the 17th green where GMAC was playing, and uh, that just shows the you know the team spirit, the team camaraderie in in the European team, and uh, it's something that I will forever be thankful to Billy because I think if he wasn't there, you know, I was probably going to wait in the locker room and I, I might have missed something very big. But he said, you know, let's come on, let's go on and support GMAC and and hopefully, luckily. He won it for us. Yeah, great memories and iconic scenes there on the on the seventeenth green when GMAC defeated Hunter Mayhem to clinch the Ryder Cup for Europe. I'd imagine there were a few sore heads the next morning. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't like to drink. Uh, I was uh, I was completely sober that night, uh, just because I don't like to drink. But I remember uh, the celebrations were were pretty wild. It was uh, it was good fun, and I think especially when you win it when the match is so tight and you win it by half a point like we did, it's even it's an even better feeling, I think. Well, 2011 to 2015, that five-year span there, you, you continued to play some pretty solid golf. You had a pair of runner-up finishes, but you, you, were, uh, you had some nagging injuries, uh, more specifically a wrist injury in that, in that period. That can be a nightmare for golfers. What was your experience with it? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't great to be honest. It's um, I started to feel pain at the end of 2011 in my left wrist, and then uh, I tried to play in 2012, but you know I was with painkillers every week and I couldn't really swing the golf club like I wanted to. So then I took a surgery middle of 2012. Then you know that only partially fixed the problem, so I had to take another surgery in 2013. And I remember, especially the, just before the one in 2013, I was uh, in a place where it's almost like you think you're never going to be playing golf again because it's, you know, I already had one surgery. I was still feeling pain. Uh, I couldn't play very good golf. Uh, it was a very dark moment. Uh, but, you know, I had, the, I was lucky. My, my wife was always very supportive of me, my whole family, my whole, you know, team and, and coach around me. And uh, just with, you know, a lot of hard work, a lot of patience, I was able to, to come out on top. Well, you had to go back to Q School in 2015 and again in, in 2016. And given, given the heights that you'd scaled in the game and reaching as high as number 14 in the world and winning a Ryder Cup, et cetera, how difficult was it to go back to Q School? And then to describe the, the intense pressure just to, uh, just to get your job back both times. Yeah, I mean, going back to Q school wasn't wasn't what what was in the plan. Uh, it was uh, something you had to do, 
And the thing is, it was very difficult, especially in 2015, because I remember I played very poorly that year, pretty much the whole season. And then you have to somehow find something and, and perform under the most intense pressure to, to get your job back. And uh, it was it was extremely difficult, even at Q2. I think I just barely, I made the cut on the number after four days. And then I had a decent fifth round. And then the last round, I think I shot four under in the last nine to make, to get the last card on the number. So there was a, it was, it was a lot of pressure. It's something that I'm, I'm lucky because it, it seems like every time there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of stuff on the line. I'm able to play my best golf. Uh, I don't know exactly why, but you know, that's, that what seems to happen. And, uh, and it's something that obviously helped me a lot in that situation. 2016 was a bit different because I felt I was making progress with my, with my game, with my swing. I went into Q school and I was playing pretty solid golf. And uh, um, I got off to a good start and I was, you know, I think in the top five pretty much throughout the week. And I think I finished tight second or so. So it was a completely different experience. It wasn't so much pressure packed that it was in 2015. Well, that progress you mentioned in, in 2016 carried through to 2017 and you claimed your third European Tour win in, in Morocco that year at the Trophy Hassan Deux. That is a really, really difficult golf course. And and given what had transpired in the seven years since your previous win, that must have been pretty emotional for you, that one. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a great week. It was unexpected because, as you said, I was playing well. I was seeing progress, but I didn't think I was going to win that early on. Um, but it was a, it was one of those weeks where everything go your way. I remember uh, missing a few shots by 50 yards in the trees and always finding a lie, managing to find a way to make a path, which, you know, it, it kind of makes you think, right, maybe this is the week. And then again, I had one of those finishes on Sunday. I think I shot, I want to say, four under in the last seven holes. To, to make it into the playoff, finishing Bird Eagle the last two. So I, it's something that doesn't happen every week and it just happened at the right time, the right week on the right golf course. And I was able to win the playoff. And then at that point, I felt like I'm, I'm back to, to where I want to be because all of a sudden you have an exemption. You can kind of work on your game without, without too much pressure because you know that you're going to be playing for a couple of years anyway. And um, it was just a, a very big turning point in my career. Well, 2021's been a, a pretty good year for you. You finished top 10 at the British Masters and then runner-up last month at the Porsche European Open. So I, I assume that fourth win, you must feel like that's around the corner pretty soon. Yeah, I feel like I'm playing uh, T2 green. I'm playing the best golf of my career. Even, you know, all my stats, all the numbers suggest that I'm, I'm pretty much at the level where I was in 2010, 2011. Um, even 2009, I'm just, I've, I've been struggling a lot on the greens. And uh, it's just very encouraging that despite those struggles on the greens, I was able to, you know, post some top tens. Uh, I finished second in Germany. I had a decent US Open. You know, I missed the last two cuts, the last two weeks, but I missed them both by one. And again, my putting performances on the green were pretty poor. So it's something where I feel like where my game is at the moment, if I just can find one decent week on the greens, I have a chance to win. And hopefully it will be one of the next few weeks. Well, the U.S. Open you mentioned, you you qualified for that uh, a few weeks ago, and that was the that was the first major championship that you'd played since two thousand and fifteen. You had a very credible finish, tied for thirty fifth. But more importantly, you hadn't seen your brother for eighteen months for various reasons, obviously with the pandemic and lockdowns, etc. So it must have been a pretty emotional reunion, given how close you two are. Yeah, it was a, it was fantastic to see him. Um, I went, uh, I flew one day early to to California uh, just to be able to spend a full day with him, his wife, and the kids. Which, as you say, I hadn't seen them uh, since uh, just I think it was the week before Christmas in 2019. So it was uh, about 18 months, mm. and it was just uh, great to you know spend a day a full day with them, uh, have a chat, uh, and just do normal things with them because. Uh, We've always uh, been very close to each other. We've always spent a lot of time together. And then not to see him and his family for such a long time, it was a, it was a bit difficult, but you know, it was a, it was a great time in, in California altogether. So looking ahead to the future, you, you have your own golf academy in Turin, the Royal Park Riveri. Is 
mentoring and, and coaching, is that something that you're looking to pursue a lot more once the playing starts to wind down? I would say so. I would say I, I particularly enjoy mentoring and coaching young kids and, and juniors who have a chance to, to, to leave their mark on the game. Uh, on one side and then the other side, which is obviously being very big lately, is, uh, is the stats and strategy and like the consulting with tour players because I still enjoy being out with them. And, and it's something, it's almost, uh, it's very humbling when, you know, someone with a guy with the likes of, you know, Fitzy or other guys in the top 20 in the world come to me and ask for advice. It's something that makes me very proud and it's something that means that, you know, probably I'm doing something right here. And uh, but as you say, there's a there's a few more years uh, in me. Uh, I still wanna wanna win a few more events. I wanna play uh, some more good golf tournaments, and then whatever the time will be, I can just you know slow it down a little bit, spend more time with the family, and I'll have some some side businesses going to keep me busy. Well, you mentioned the juniors at, at the academy. Is there some form of uh, I have looked at the Instagram page, but is there some form of junior elite squad or, or scholarship system, excuse me, that you use for uh, for the kids coming through to award them the opportunity and, and provide pathways and platforms for them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we started, we only had um, around 45 kids. Uh, this is two years ago. And uh, now together with the with the coaches at the academy that work there full time, we're up to 125. So obviously the, the club is very happy. Uh, it feels like we're doing a good job. And then uh, we're now in the process of uh, starting a proper scholarship with uh, um, a school about five kilometers away from the from the club, so in, in the area. Uh, we had one guy going, one girl actually, doing it this year as a test. And then I think next year it'd be, it'd be a little bit more. And it's something that, you know, given my education, my, my background is something that anytime a kids come to me and say, oh, what do I need to, what do I, what do I need? to play some good golf i always tell him you have to go to school be good at school and then be good at golf because it's it's usually when you go to school it opens your mind you you're a better person at the end of your degree and also it gives you a second opportunity if golf doesn't go your way which uh, I, I just see these days i see too many kids that they just leave school way too early start playing golf and then we're 22, 23, all of a sudden and the first day they shoot a 78 is a, is a proper tragedy because they don't know what else to do in life. Well, I think always having a second chance, it's, a, it's just a, a very good um, option to have in the background and it's something that at the end of the day is going to help your golf game as well. Well, actually on that note, it's, it's actually quite an interesting sh subject that uh, I talk about quite often with my friends who have played professional sports and I know for myself I walked away from the game at, at 30 and, and you said you went through a, a dark period around 2013 you you're I mean you were fortunate that you had the engineering degree for me I know for me I threw all my eggs in the one basket with golf which is what nearly all the young guys coming through do now uh, and obviously as you suggested going to school and having something to fall back on and an education is is terrific but What's your advice, I guess, what is your advice to elite amateurs coming through now who have thrown all their eggs into the one basket and are not really, not necessarily thinking about what's going to happen for them at the age of 30, 35, when they've only ever known golf and they walk away from it? Well, if you, if you already made the decision, then obviously you have to, you have to sacrifice yourself. You have to, um, I, I don't think, uh, I never thought just only talent can do it. So regardless of how good you were as an amateur, there's, there's going to be someone that practices more than you. And at the end of the day, it's just going to beat you in the long term. So I think if you want to be a successful golfer, you just have to be willing to, to put the hours in. And it's like, it's not hours every other day, it's just hours each and every day. And then also I think uh, the practice needs to be very focused, very uh, meaningful. Uh, I just see too many kids, uh, you know, not even kids, but like guys 20, 22 years old, just a pro, and then they're practicing with, you know, iPhone on the side with music, or they're just, you know, taking a phone call every 10 minutes, uh, checking the Instagram every hour. I don't think that's the, that's the ideal path to become a professional golfer, a successful one at least. It must give you an enormous sense of pride when you see the, the likes of what, 
Matteo Manassero, Andrea Pavan, Renato Paratore, and just recently Guido Migliozzi, what they've achieved in the game, winning and you know going close to winning majors, etc. Yourself and your brother are obviously uh, heroes to these guys, and and to see the players coming through and what they're achieving, it must it must be very special for you. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic feeling. It's always a very special when someone from Italy is able to to get to that high level. Uh, we still don't have many golfers, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully, after the Ryder Cup, there will be more and more kids uh, playing in Italy. But uh, as you say, something uh, special is something that we're always very happy when it happens. And uh, I think, you know, I've been saying for, for a long time, but I think that Guido is probably the one that I see with the most talent, with the most potential going forward. And, uh, and I think it's starting to show this year and, and I'm sure he will be there in, in years to come and he will be able to, to reach some, some very hefty goals. Well, the Wado Italy uh, hosting the Ryder Cup in two years' time in 2023. Obviously, you've mentioned a huge goal of yours to play another Ryder Cup. Obviously, it would be a, a dream to play alongside your brother. But do you feel any uh, any sort of emotion uh, behind the public in Italy getting around, supporting the event? It's, go- it's obviously going to be a, a huge spectacle there. Yeah, I think uh, the, the perception in the public is growing a lot. I think uh, the Ryder Cup is such a big event that even if Italy is not a proper golfing country, I think uh, it would be it would be a great show. Uh, it would be a fantastic week. I think uh, the golf course uh, I haven't played it yet. I know from some friends who played it, which is uh, which is really good, and I'm looking forward to playing it this year in the Italian Open. Uh, the crowds will be unbelievable because uh, even like football crowds in Rome are always different than than other places. So I'm sure the mix between some Italian people and some people from other countries in Europe would be it would be pretty explosive, and uh, and I'm sure it would be a fantastic week that everyone will remember for a long time. Well, it certainly sounds like you've got some uh, options going forward in eight to ten years, or or perhaps longer when your career does wind down. But does it interest you at all to follow in the footsteps of the likes of Thomas Bjorn or? Um, uh, David Howell to go onto the European Tour Board or the Players Committee as one of the more respected minds out there on tour. Does that pathway interest you at all? Um, maybe, maybe one day I will. I was on the tournament committee for uh, six, seven years, I think, and I enjoyed my time there. But I think uh, the last couple of years I wanted to focus a bit more on my golf and on, on my other ventures. And uh, to be honest, I didn't have enough time to, to, to dedicate to the, to the tournament committee. It's almost like when I do something, I want to do it 100%. And then if I can't give my 100%, I'm just, I'd rather, do, I'd rather have someone else do it. And that's what happened with the tournament committee. Obviously, the board will be a different story. But, you know, it's, as I said, at the moment, I'm, I'm still focused on my golf. And then we can have that discussion in, in a few years' time and see, see where I'm at. If they need help or if they need a, an opinion for myself, I'll always be available. Eduardo Molinari, thank you very much for coming on the Life on Tour podcast. It's been a pleasure chatting to you and we wish you all the very best this week at the Aberdeen Scottish Open and uh, the rest of 2021. I look forward to seeing you hoist that fourth trophy very soon. Thank you very much, Ivan. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. To watch another European Tour video, click here. And to subscribe, click here.